All right, welcome everybody. Today's discussion is a story of greed, terror, and heroism Africa. And we'll be trying to, um, I don't know, dig deeper and hopefully I'm gonna offer you some context into this very dense yet important and well-written book. So remember, going back to what King Leopold promised, much like other new imperialist colonists promised their colonies, that he would end the East African slave trade, that he would bring humanitarian policies to pass, uh, that he would allow free trade <clears throat> amongst various African colonial areas, and he would invite missionaries, philanthropists, and scientists in to have them do what they do. On page 44 and 45 of Hosschild's book, he quotes King Leopold in the following. He says, Leopold said, my goal is to open to civilization the only part of the globe which it has not yet penetrated to the piece of darkness which hangs over entire peoples it is, I dare say, a crusade worthy of this century of progress. It seemed to me that Belgium, a centrally located and neutral country, would be a suitable place for such a meeting. So he's talking about trying in his efforts to civilize Africa. <clears throat> if you remember from the book, if I can pick on you, um, Hannah and Emma, what does it mean to you to civilize? Like, how did Europeans want to, quote unquote, civilize Africans? Make them more like them. Yeah, make them more like them. For example, <clears throat> when Stanley came across and many other Europeans came across uh, folks who practice this keloid scarification in the Congo Basin, <clears throat> Have you two ever seen this sort of scarification? Right, it's like- um, a, Yeah, in a documentary once. Yeah, it's permanent. It's not like a tattoo, but it's a, a burn. I think it's a burn, right? That's how you do it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like they hit them with a special sort of stick and it like leaves a mark forever the way mm -hmm. it heals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Europeans were, isn't that beautiful? I don't know if I'd have it done on me, but it's just beautiful. Yeah, it is cool looking, but I think it would be pretty painful. I agree. I don't even have a tattoo, right? So you're talking to somebody who <clears throat> does not mark his body. So as you remember, when Stanley and other Europeans saw these, you know, scantily dressed, it's really hot in the Congo. You don't need a lot of clothes, especially if your skin's dark and you're not going to get a sunburn. And folks who had this keloid scarification, they were kind of flabbergasted by it. So if you remember, Stanley wanted to sell them used clothes. So on one hand, he wanted to civilize them by clothing them. <clears throat> Sorry, I got just had a lunch. So on one hand, he wanted to civilize Africans by clothing them. And the other hand, um, they wanted to create markets to sell more soap, to sell more clothes, to sell more European products in order to increase the colonial net worth of um, their enterprise. And look at this ad. What strikes you about this ad, Hannah or Emma? It came out in 1895 and it says, you dirty boy, why don't you wash yourself with vinolia soap? Um, well, for one, they're, they're saying he's dirty, but that's just this color of his skin, I think. They're just, um, sounds like they're making fun of him. Totally making fun of him, even though she's going to get her pretty little shoes all wet in the surf. But yeah, they're making fun of him and his dirty self, calling him a dirty African. So why don't you wash yourself? So it's a very racist way to sell soap, but the point is they're trying to sell European sold products um, to other folks. Here's another rather infamous advertisement. Um, I'm going to read to you what it says down below. This is a sea captain or an admiral of a ship, and he's washing his hands right here. And you can see him down below. It seems like a missionary or some European handing down to this poor African or whomever he is something. Here are European ships unloading their cargo, <clears throat> just trying to ex um, get across the fact that Europeans are trading with these colonial outposts. So it says, quote, the words down here, the first step towards lightening the white man's burden and the white man's burden is to help civilize brown people is through teaching the virtues of cleanliness. 
So pear soap, this is the thing they're selling, pear soap is a potent factor in brightening the dark corners of the earth as civilization advances. While amongst the culture of all nations, it holds the highest place. It is the ideal toilet soap. Isn't that a pretty, pretty crazy way to sell soap, Hannah and Becky? Hannah and um, Emma? Definitely, it's, um, but it was probably pretty popular at the time. Yeah, you got that right. And, um, and it also went along with many of the colonial regime's idea that, you know what, we're going, we're doing all these efforts to colonize African countries and South Asia, but you know what, and this is marketed towards their own people in England and Belgium and France and elsewhere, these growing markets, for, uh, these will be growing markets for our goods. <clears throat> so this ad here shows how much more the tropical African colonies of Britain is um, helping the home country, right? Goods we sold and goods we received. So this is bring, uh, painting a rosy picture for many. Another aspect of the civilizing mission was the following. Um, educating, um, you might wonder when you're gonna watch the film Virunga, or you're gonna watch another film about the Congo um, in part four and five little clips of the film. You're like, geez, all these Congolese people speak French. Well, that was the lingua franca of the Belgian empire is French. So here are Congolese young people learning the French alphabet. Right, so on one hand, the new imperialism brought education. And the other thing it brought was Christianity, right? Not full stop, but many Christian missionaries went to, uh, these are French missionaries actually in the French colonies in South in Africa. And the goal was for many Christians to follow Paul's word, word Right, St. Paul was the great spokesman and salesman of Christianity way back in the early days. So go out and preach the gospel. So this is a 1913 map of Africa produced by um, the Christian Mission Society. And they show the Christian areas, right? Here's a little Christian area down here. And there's a couple others here and there, not many. Most of the dark green, can you make out what this what they're calling the dark green folks here? The heathens. Oh yeah, he, what does heathen mean? Do you all call each other heathens anymore? What's a heathen? Kind of like an uncivilized savage person. That's what they mean it to be, somebody who isn't like you, right, a heathen. And the light green um, is a Mohammedan, meaning they are is, uh, Muslim and Muslim folks live up here. Remember, a lot of this area is empty country, not too people live in the Sahara Desert. Not too many folks live there, but some do. So these English missionaries were part of the whole new imperialist project, right? Here you have, um, I think a couple female English missionaries down in Africa, and here's them with a bunch of little kids, right? Rather an awkward looking, photograph, but these are missionaries taking pictures in order to show their congregation back at home that they're doing God's work, that they're doing good work. <clears throat> Have you got to the part where they talk about William Shepherd yet, this Presbyterian minister? Yeah. Yeah, here he is. What's your take on William Shepherd? He's kind of a weird guy. Like, yeah. I mean, he was brave and stuff, but he's also done like some weird stuff. Yeah, I agree totally. What do you mean by weird? Give me an example. Like, I guess this seems like it's brave, but to the point where he's being like risky. Like he jumped in a river to catch a hippo and almost got like killed by a crocodile. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it seems like he's really like into it, right? He. It seems like to me, he's not there to really like, okay, I'm a Christian and I want you to write um, convert, but also he really embraces African life, it seems. This is one of the only pictures I've found in which there are um, these Congolese people, these Cuba, actually laughing in a 
picture. And here he is with a big old python or a big snake. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? And look at all the kids who are just laughing at this guy like, oh my gosh, he's got a big old snake. So, right, there's a whole gamut of missionaries who are down there. Some of them treat, the, some of them help King Leopold, right? You all are reading about how some Christian missionaries were straight up allied with King Leopold and his whole nasty project. Yeah. But what did other missionaries do? Some of them were like genuinely trying to help the Congolese and then like others, I think, just were just kind of there like there were some people who were like trying to help and didn't like it at all there were others who were clearly allied with Leopold and then there were others who were just there they didn't really cause any harm but they didn't really do anything good you're right just like freaking people every everywhere I think right I think that just shows you when you say Christian missionaries you can't pigeonhole them into one category right it depends on who they are, what their background was, etc. I think William Shepard um, actually really was, was able to relate because he was an African American, right? He experienced racism in the United States. So he understood the persecution that uh, the Cuba and Congolese people were going through. Um, in fact, you're exactly right. And I think that was Hannah who was speaking. This Swedish missionary named uh, Sloblom knew about the atrocities, many knew about the atrocities that were happening, but, and a few of them started to come forth and use their privilege as European missionaries in order to get the word out. A lot like George Washington Williams did. He tried to get the word out. William Shepard tried to get the word out. This guy got the word out big time. <clears throat> here he has, in, here he is in front of a map of um, Africa pointing at the Congo. And it was these European missionaries who went out and photographed the atrocities because many in the West would not believe them. They would say, man, that's fake news. What are you talking about, preacher? But they said, all right, forget it. We're going to show, right? These are severed hands, severed and dried hands, right, from the Congo area. They expose the fact that there's burned villages, murdered children, and all these atrocities. And remember how Me Leopold was really upset at these missionaries who were telling on him, who were exposing him? Yeah. <clears throat> In fact, the famous American writer, who was very sarcastic, right? Everything you read, most things you read from Mark Twain, remember he's coming from a sarcastic interpretation, kind of like, you know, late, late night TV hosts and things. He is pretending to speak um, from the perspective of King Leopold in this quote. He says, blister the meddlesome missionaries. They seem to be always around, always spying, always eyewitnessing the happenings and everything they see, they commit to paper. One of these missionaries saw 81 of these hands drying over a fire for transmission to my officials. So this is Mark Twain's 1905 soliloquy to King Leopold in which he offers just a scathing repudiation of everything that Leopold did. And it, um, and it sold a lot of copies. In 1905, Mark Twain was a very, very famous American writer. Hannah and Emma, have you read anything of Mark Twain's? Yeah, we read uh, Huckleberry Finn last year for English, so yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was, it was, it was good. It was definitely a satire, um, but yeah. And you kind of have to get into his rhythm and his perspective to really start to follow it. But once you do, he's, I think he's hilarious myself. He's very funny in like a dry way. Very dry way. Yeah, very dry. All right. Um, and all this led to, as you all are reading about, the population happening, and uh, we'll call it a genocide, um, Congo went from about 20 million people to 10 million people during the duration of King Leopold and the Belgian Congo's era during these era. And that's just horrific. And the world knew about it. That's the thing. At the time, the world knew about it because of the missionaries and uh, morale and all these other journalists and casemen are bringing these, this information out to the world. And they learned about it from images like this in which they right, missionaries would put the white 
um, garment around them just so you can get really the effect of their hand being chopped off. And my question, and this is a long windup to get at the crux of my point today, how do everyday people do this to everyday people? And last time we spoke, I think it was Hannah or Emma mentioned that it's this process of dehumanizing somebody else, like somehow treat, look at them like a fly, like as easy as you could kill a fly, you could kill a Congolese or you could cut off their hand or foot. This is a somewhat, of somewhat a very tragic image of this father looking at the cut off foot and hand of his son. Right, and just doesn't get more real than that. So how do you do this? And it took a lot of work and that's what I'm gonna be talking about right now. And please stop me if y'all have any questions. My questions that I already uploaded to the canvas, this is called New Imperialism and Colonized People on Display at the World's Fairs. So it's the following questions I will attempt to um, explain. What strikes you how new imperialism displayed itself in the world's fairs? How did displaying colonized people dehumanize them? What strikes you about the role of scientific racism in the process of dehumanizing colonial peoples? This series of slides and the chat I'll have with you will also help you answer chapter 11, number three, and I will upload this as a series of slides so you don't have to get this all down now if you don't want to. So chapter 11, number three, I ask you about what strikes you about the 1897 World's Fair in Brussels and the case of Otavenga. And also in chapter 19, that he discusses the Royal Museum in Central Africa. And we'll talk about that. Okay, so on to the World's Fairs. <clears throat> so the industrialization of Western Europe and North America came with it, um, a lot of technological progress, which we've talked about and you've read about, but they wanted to show it off to the world. Remember, we started this class way back in which Western Europe was the backwater of the world in 1500, right? By now, by the late 1800s, Europe's at the pinnacle of their power in the world, right? China had not ascended yet as they are now. So in this time, 1850s to roughly World War I, Europe and in the United States was at the pinnacle of their global power. And they wanted to show it off at these various world's fairs and the world's fairs happened um, at various times throughout the world, throughout different places in the world. This one happens to be the, the 1851 fair in London. And at the 1851 world's fair in London, England, it lasted right from the spring to the fall, six million people went there. It was a big, big deal, right? Um, look at all the different kinds of people who went, right? You have Scots dressed up down here. You have uh, soldiers going to check it out over here. You have what looks like everyday working class or middle class folks hanging out under the tree. Um, and Monday through Saturday, it was pretty freaking expensive to go. If you wanted to go Monday through Saturday, it was about 400 bucks in our time. But if you want to go Sunday, you only had to pay about six bucks, one shilling in our current money. So a lot of various people went from throughout the world. Uh, this Crystal Palace actually survived all the way to World War II and it was bombed by the Germans in World War II. It's today at uh, the current location is Hyde Park, England, if you ever decide to go. And within the walls of the Crystal Palace, oh, by the way, it really was made of glass. That's why they called it the Crystal Palace. So the fact that this big massive building was made of glass and iron, <clears throat> glass and iron and steel, and there was so many water fountains using, um, using uh, electric steam engines to shoot water and fountains everywhere. It was a modern technological marvel that people just were awed from. Just think if you're from this little, you know, podunk town in England and you travel all the way to go check out the World's Fair on Sunday when you could afford to go, you'd go inside and you'd see um, an envelope machine, kitchen appliances, a reaping machine, a thing that um, harvests for you, daguerreotype, an early kind of camera. Uh, you could see a barometer that 
uh, measures the pressure of air using leeches. There was public bathrooms for the first time. We take this for granted people, but before there were public bathrooms, um, Emma or Becky, where did, where was most human waste? Where did it go? Where did it end up? Human waste before. Um, I'm sure like they went in pots and then they like dumped it out their windows. Yeah, in the urban areas, it was just chucked into the street, right? Sometimes in rural areas, it was, you know, so they dug a hole. But this is the first time there was public bathrooms in which you flushed and it just went somewhere else. It still usually went like into the river or somewhere horrific like that. Um, but pretty soon London will be getting uh, internal sewage. I'm sorry, sewage lines under the streets of London. So all these cool things, and, and this wasn't only in Ch uh, London, Chicago um, saw, hosted the 1893 World's Fair. This whole place was built for the World's Fair. It's still there. And it had all these um, steam powered fountains that made everybody go ooh and ah, right? Just this big, huge area. The San Francisco exposition area right on, right near the Presidio, that was all built for the fair. The 1903 Panama exposition. <clears throat> The Chicago World's Fair also featured um, the rather new invention of rubber tires. And here they are, here they're riding their relatively new bicycles, right? And again, where do they get a lot of most of this rubber? In 1893, where's most of the rubber coming from, Hannah or Emma? From the Congo. You got it, and there they are. Um, here's the Cal, I just had to throw in a California thing. At the St. Louis Exposition in 1904, the California exhibit included an elephant covered in walnuts. Just to show you like, yep, we're Cali and we have avocados, we got walnuts, right? We have all these goods. So these fairs were showcases for all the wealth that, right, the United States and Western Europe was accruing. At the same time, well, let me just um, go back a little. British had colonized India and specifically what was the Sikh Empire up here in 1830, beginning in 1836. And part of the spoils of war that Britain came um, into the possession of when they made a deal with the king of the Sikhs to be their colonial masters in 1836 was this um, big, huge diamond. Today, it's the British crown jewel, the biggest diamond in the world at the time. And Britain displayed this huge diamond, the Lahore diamond, they called it. Is that what it's called? Yep. <clears throat> yep. Um, and they displayed it in the India section at the World's Fairs. Do you know where this biggest diamond in the world is today, where it's displayed? Ooh. In the British Museum, I'm guessing. Yes. Good guess. Hello, Evan. Good to see you. Oh my gosh, Hannah, Em, and I, Emma, uh, Evan, Hannah, Emma, and I were lonely. So good to see you. No, it's not displayed on the woman on the in the British Museum. It's displayed on the Queen's head, her famous hat, the crown. There it is, still to this day, right? The big diamond. So recently, India has been asking Britain for the diamond back. And you know what Britain says? No, exactly, Evan. Good to have you. No, you cannot have the diamond back. It's ours. <clears throat> the United States also was playing this new imperialistic game. We'll get more into this if you take my US History 17B class. In fact, in 1899, the United States had just beat Spain in the Spanish-American War and we inherited or took Spain's former colonies of the Philippines and Cuba. And we'd also recently um, colonized Hawaii, which is right in here, okay? And at this exposition, the Great um, Greater America Exposition, right? We're showing off our stuff. Look at Uncle Sam has pulled up his shirt sleeves and he's pointing to Americans how where we're going to practice the white man's burden and help these people out of their brownness, for lack of a better term. 
and it was our first colonial exhibit. And at this and other fairs, right, this is the one in Buffalo, but very similar, there were exhibits of the goods from, for example, Hawaii, right? All these goods that are produced in Hawaii that we're hoping to sell, excuse me. But there's also people. And here's where I'm getting at. How do everyday people do these horrible things to everyday people? Well, it's part of this dehumanizing process in which you put people on display. So at the 1901 fair in Buffalo, New York, these quote unquote hula hula girls from Hawaii were brought all the way from Hawaii to upstate New York and put on display. And they were made to dance, right? Do the hula dance, of course, topless. And um, that became just a regular part of these expositions. At the same exposition, is this Buffalo? Or this might be St. Louis, let me see where it's at. Uh, this is 1904 in St. Louis. Some people from the Philippines, from the highlands of the Philippines were brought all the way to St. Louis, Missouri. And they were kind of, they were not kind of, they were put on display for the audience to check out. Evan, what strikes you about that? If I can pick on you, good to see you. I just think it's crazy that people would do that to other people. Like they wouldn't just think like, oh, would I want to see my kid being there? And like, they wouldn't put themselves in the situation. They would just do it. And I think that is very unbelievable. Yeah, but very real. You're right. They aren't showing like Filipino doctors, are they? They're like, no, this is how a Filipino doctor does his practice. They aren't showing a Filipino banker. No, they went to the mountains to some more rural people and look what they're calling them, headhunters. Total nasty racist thing to call them. Um, and by the way, Filipino, Philippines were US colony from 1898 to 1950. And here they are put, put on display, putting them in their place, right? Could you imagine how awkward it would be? Like, wait a minute, they're all wearing clothes and we're just chilling out here in Missouri. What's going on? Um, same thing with these Native American um, young women. Made these Native American women from, I think, the Pueblo area. They put up a totem pole over here. This is the fairgrounds in St. Louis. Here's a totem pole. Here's a basketball court, just to add to the weirdness. And they put up this TP. And where are they from? Well, it's fair. Oh, doesn't say. And can you tell what they're doing? Holding weapons. Yeah, they're shooting a bow and arrow. Indian girl archers. So once again, they're putting these people, these conquered, colonized people on display in order, um, I'm arguing, to dehumanize them. At these world fairs, there was also African-Americans being put on display. The title for this display or this exhibit is called the Home in the Old Plantation. So of course they have grandpa playing the guitar, playing the banjo and sipping lemonade, maybe scratching his head once in a while and going, ah, oh, gee, shucks, howdy, right? So they built this display. This is a totally fabricated, fabricated like museum display. Um, similarly, here are African-American women and this display is called the American South, performances by African nations. Well, these weren't African nations. These were African-American people who you know, most of them, some of them came as early as 1619, right? Some of the first peoples to come to the United States who weren't Native Americans. How do you think many Americans who went and saw this thought of African Americans and Native Americans and Filipinos and Hawaiians? What would you think if you were a little kid, Evan, uh, going through these expositions? I would be quite interested to say the least in probably think that they were uh, uncivilized, I think is the right word. Yeah, very, I, I agree. I on one hand, you'd be really- kind of what they're going for. Hannah and Emma, do you agree? On one hand, you'd be like, whoa, that's pretty interesting about uh, these girls being able to shoot arrows and right, this African-American home that maybe you've never seen. Well, I mean, probably because at that time, nobody like was going to go looking for like how they'd actually live. So they're, they, 
I would probably at that time think it was like cool and think that it was okay because all the adults would think it was okay. But like now I would be like, no way. But then I'd probably be like, sure, it's cool. Yeah, and you're right. And you're capturing the sentiment of many folks. I'm well done. Also on display in, I don't know if you can see this rather washed out image. I think Hannah and Emma, you saw this last time, but this is a postcard you could buy for the quote unquote Africa display in Buffalo, New York. Here's a, a couple African men from Africa, not African-American, but African. And can you see the short thing that's in the middle of them? Can you make that out? What is that, Evan? Orangutan. It looks an orangutan dressed up with clothes, right? So the orangutans dressed up, kind of dressed up, just like these African men are kind of dressed up. So doesn't that seem pretty just dehumanizing, right? That they aren't freaking, it's so racist, right? And they were, so um, yeah, a racist display of people in order to dehumanize them and therefore justify the actions, you know, colonists took against them. Um, every afternoon, you can see the pygmies from Central Africa dancing right in front of the Palace of Manufacturers. Right here's what Western Europeans and Americans do. We manufacture high-tech stuff. And what do Africans do? They dance for us. Interesting, right? Um, so the case of Otabenga in chapter, I forget, you're going to read about Otabenga. What's another example of dehumanizing Africans? Well, in 1906, if you were in New York City and where you were in the Bronx and their borough, and you went to the monkey house in New York City at the Bronx Zoo, you would read this plaque. You know how when you go to muse, um, zoos, they have little plaques explaining the, the critter's background? Well, in this case, the critter is this young man. Um, it was called the African Pygmy Otabenga. He's age 23 height four feet, 11 inches. He weighs 103 pounds. He's brought from the Kasai River, Congo by Dr. Samuel Werner with the permission of um, King Leopold at the time. And he's exhibited each afternoon in September. Isn't that just disturbing, Hannah, Emma, and Evan? Yeah, it's... If that, yeah, that's, that's not right. No. But at the time you would probably think, oh, they're, they're probably not that smart. Oh, they're like monkeys. So it's not really that big of a deal, but you know. If you're an audience member, exactly. And that was the whole point of this. In order, um, we many argue to shape non-colonized people's minds to show them that, hey, they aren't human. They're kind of more like monkeys. That's why we put them in the monkey house. So thank goodness we're over in the Philippines or the Congo or India or all these uh, colonized places in order to help them because that's our white man's burden and we want to show you how uncivilized they are, right? 40,000 attended a week to go see Otabenga in the monkey house. Um, Here's Otabengo with what four other Congolese young men on display at the St. Louis Zoo. So they went on tour, right? The last image I showed you was from the uh, in New York. This is a couple of years earlier from St. Louis. But um, Evan, do you think all the audience members were down with this? Uh, I would think that there would be a fair share that would be against it. Yeah, you're right. There was critics. Um, this New York Times article um, reads, Bushmen share a cage with Bronx Park apes. Some laugh over his antics, but many are not pleased. Right? And it talks about how some don't like it. The exhibition was that of a human being in a monkey cage. The human happened to be a Bushman. Anyway, this is an article that just uh, gives evidence to the fact that not everybody was down with this. Similarly, you're all gonna be reading in chapter 19, how King Leopold in an effort to celebrate all his um, policies and all the wealth he was making in the Congo, 
and to show the Belgian people that they were correct in supporting his enterprise, builds the big Royal Museum of Central Africa. Are any of you at that part yet when they talk about the Royal Museum of Central Africa? It's kind of towards the end. Well, this is the big thing that uh, Leopold built all in dedication to um, the Congo. Here is a statue with some Congolese people on top and the bust of King Leopold right in the middle, surrounded by various flamingos and elephants and lions. This is the fountain thing right in front of the museum. And if you went in the museum, they showed images of, right, mannequins of Congolese people fishing, just like the exhibits. Um, here are some goods from the Congolese Museum. I'm sorry, from the Congo. Here is a Congolese person dressed up, right? So you would just be able to, like Evan and Hannah was saying, on one hand, it's super interesting. I freaking love museums. But I'm, I've also, as I've gotten older, questioned like, where'd they get this stuff, right? How did they come to own this stuff? Um, here's a current, uh, one of the more recent exhibits at the Congolese Museum. Here's a sick Congolese person with a medicine man standing over him. And here's a couple audience members just checking out the plaque and being curious at the Congolese Museum. So this whole thing about displaying the colonized bodies um, plays a big role in how we look at them. Another key component in how Westerners saw the rest of the world starting in the late 1800s was this thing called scientific racism. And you've heard the term Caucasian. What does Caucasian mean, Evan, Emma, or Hannah? A Caucasian usually implies that they are um... Uh, from European descent or white. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what? It's a totally made up term by this guy here, uh, Jonathan Friedrich Blumenbach, um, German guy who was into skulls. So he had a bunch of skulls from the, throughout the world and he wanted to find, quote unquote, the most beautiful one, the perfect one that, right, really expressed the ultimate um, beacon of evolution, right? This is the most beautiful one. And he just so happened to pick one from the area of Georgia, not Atlanta, Georgia, but Georgia today. And he called it the Ca uh, Caucasian after the Caucasus Mountains. So this is an area of Southern Russia. And he said, yep, this is the most beautiful one, right? Just ordering humans by sort of these made up um, criteria. And what's more, uh, not only him, but other folks who practice this fake science called scientific racism started to, let me show you another image. They started to come up with characterizations of quote unquote, the different races. So that same guy, uh, Blumenbach came up with five different human races, right? And here are five of them. And just judging from the picture, I won't even tell you where he thinks they're from, but which one seems the most modern and progressive? The white man. Yeah, the guy in the middle, right? The guy in the middle. Um, boop, boop. And they backed it up with words. So they came up with these uh, four or five different races. Americans are what we would call Native Americans, Africans from Africa, Asians, Asians, and Europeans. So Americans um, were considered, right, these are their characteristics, reddish, stubborn, and angered easily. Africans were black, relaxed, and negligent. Asians are yellow, avaricious, which means greedy, and easily distracted. While whites, uh, while Europeans are white, gentle, and inventive. Huh. Evan, what strikes you about that? Yeah, it's quite interesting because uh, it, it puts a lot of pieces together to say the least. Uh, like um, I was always curious to why uh, Asians were classified as yellow, I guess. Why and, they're considered yellow? Yeah, and I guess this kind of makes it make sense now. 
Yeah, there's a long history of just calling them yellow, right? Uh, judging people by what we think their skin color is. And shoot, I think this is yellow. I've never seen an Asian person this color, right? right. Yellow color. Uh, Emma or Hannah, what strikes you about these characteristics? Um, perhaps that the first thing listed for each of them is the color of their skin, which is like, it's just an organ. It just, <laughs> you know, like, it's just an organ. If we all judged each other by what our livers looked like, it would be weird. It would. So, so I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> and all, like, the Europeans, they're gentle and inventive, and then Americans, angered easily. Africans, they're like negligent, negligent. And mm. then the Asians are easily distracted. It's like, they're the best out of all of them. Yeah, and greedy, they're greasy, greedy and easily distracted. Squirrel, yeah. So you're right, it's just a made up thing in order to justify that, hey, we're better and it's okay if we're down there colonizing, doing these things that are kind of, you know, maybe not okay and not too Christian, but it's because we're better and we need to help these other people. Does that make sense? So that's scientific racism. Um, so he writes, Adam Hostel writes in 294, and my larger question is, I should just repeat this question. Cut and paste it. Hang with me, people. Where is the picture? I can't fight. So my bigger question is how does every, how do everyday people do this to everyday people? And how do we live with this legacy of what happened in the Congo and elsewhere? And Hostile wrote, the world we live in is shaped far less by what we celebrate and mythologize than by the painful events we try to forget. For example, <clears throat> you're gonna watch a little clip. I think it's in part four in which forgetting, I did not spell forgetting correctly, in which a historian goes and visits a chocolate shop in Antwerp, Belgium. Antwerp was one of the main ports of entry um, in the Congo, in Belgium. And do you see what these little chocolates are shaped as? Hands. Hands. You can, I'm gonna show you the website in the materials, you can still go to chocolate shops in, in Belgium and buy little chocolate black hands and eat that yummy dark Belgian chocolate. Whoa, isn't that crazy? I mean, that's, that's, I mean, they're either doing it like, oh, we did this in the past and this is bad, or they're like, yes, we rock. <laughs> or it's <different. laughs> That's exactly right. Like, oh yeah, we rock, we did it. Oh, that's such a dark way to look at it, but I think you're right, Hannah. Um, my argument is that many Belgians forgot, don't know, don't want to know, right? They just forgot what happened. And that's a big part of the end of the book. Once you start getting to the end of the book, um, King Leopold and what he was doing in the Congo was front page news in the world right? Mark Twain and all kinds of movers and shakers were involved in ending this thing, right? And getting Le King Leopold out and they succeeded. It was like uh, what Hostel says, the number one and the biggest human rights campaign at the time. Um, but events after that made many forget about it, right? Because World War II happened and it got everybody's mind off of the Congo and into World War II. I'm sorry, World War I. Yeah, and still to this day, I show you the link uh, in the assignment. You can buy chocolate hands online from this store in Antwerp. Please don't do it, but I'm going to give you a link to the store. Crazy. Um, how else did we forget? What's another example of forgetting? Well, I think the chocolate hands are an example of how Belgians forgot what happened in the Congo. I don't think... Evan, what do you think about Hannah, Hannah's analysis that this just might be the Belgians saying, oh, heck yeah, we rock. I have to agree with you. It is a quite dark way of uh, looking at it, but it's also, um, 
just an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, I don't think the Belgian storekeeper would, would be proud, yeah. right? Saying, yeah. I don't think they have a picture of the cut off hands of the kids. Well, you could be like, like, why else would they make chocolate hands? It they All must right. rem, they must have remembered if they're making chocolate hands. I'm gonna let the video explain a little bit about that. So this is a little teaser. So you check out it's a, just a nine minute clip of the documentary that talks about the hands. Okay, so that's a teaser. Another way that the world forgot about the Congo was through this very popular. Um, series of comic books that was put out uh, in the 1930s by this um, Dutch guy named Herge. And it's called The Adventures of Tintin. And Tintin goes on all these adventures and has all these um, harrowing things happen to him. And he always comes and saves the day at the end. Right, here's Tintin and his little doggy. This time they're going to the Congo and they're gonna totally retell the story of the Congo. And the story in a nutshell, in this comic book is that here's Tintin going to the Congo and people in, in uh, Europe are welcome, you know, wishing him goodbye. Here's a young, the Boy Scouts have just recently started. Here's a young little Boy Scout, right? And here he is going to the Congo and these local Congolese are saying, hey, we're gonna take you to this one, you know, bad guy's place and can you check him out? So here's Tintin being taken to the bad guy's place right? And here's the bad guy going, I'm going to get Tintin. I'm going to kill by my ancestors, by my ancestors, me, me, myself, kill miserable white men, right? He doesn't know how to speak English properly. And here he is with Tintin tied up. He say, tomorrow, I'm going to put you to death. And then somehow Tintin gets away, escapes, and the Congolese all thank this white savior who came to save the Congolese from this one bad guy king. Wait, why do the Congolese look like monkey fish people? Because it's just extremely racist. What do you think, Evan? I didn't see it like that, like uh, monkey fish people, but I did think of it as racist and like how it almost looks like they're wearing full body suits almost. Yeah, like, yeah, they aren't. <laughs> that they're not depicted in a very, in as a humanistic way as the other folks are, right? Yeah. Yeah, where's my... Oh. Okay. Well, it's just they had the huge lips and like the chimpanzee face. So it was like, mm, they look like monkeys and fish and they don't really look very much like people, so. Yeah, so in other words, it's a very dehumanizing look, right? Again, this is my whole point. How did Western Europeans, on one hand, justify what was going on and then forget about it? Well, you don't see um, Congolese like people. For example, here's another image of that from the United States showing how at these world fairs, even darkies had their day. So here's a drawing of when African Americans went to the world's fair, right? And here, of course, they're, they have, like you said, these crazy big lips. A lot of them are not are half dressed. They're dressed in what a nomadic African person would wear during wartime. And they're eating watermelon, of course. So again, another just caricature, very racist caricature of um, Africans. And this is from the United States, 1893. Crazy, right? <clears throat> So does that make sense, the dehumanizing um, project of the World's Fairs? Yes. Yeah. And the role of, if you display colonized people like this, geez, that might, I don't know about justify, but offer a rationale about why we can do so many of these nasty things in the Congo or India or even to our Native Americans or even African Americans here. Definitely. Okay. All right, hey, uh, you three stay on. I'm gonna stop the lecture. You all Zoom me if you have any questions, okay?